Hi everyone, I am Dr. Madan Pandian from India. Today we are going to discuss a case of plantar fasciopathy. A 50 year old hypothyroid lady with chronic heel pain for six months duration presented with more severity of pain, particularly on getting up from bed, no relief from NSAIDs or MCR footwear either. There was very little pain relief with ice packs. This is how she presented with. She had severe pain on the heel and the Achilles tendon as well. On clinical examination, the calcaneal jump sign was positive. The calcaneal jump is tenderness over the medial calcaneal tubercle. This is actually a more sensitive test, but very less specific for plantar fasciitis whereas the windlass test which is much more specific nearly 100 percent specific can be done either the patient standing or lying down trying to stretch the plantar fascia gives pain over the heel and imaging she was a known hypothyroid as discussed she was freshly diagnosed to be a diabetic with a fasting blood sugar of 168 milligrams per cent. The X-ray showed a calcaneal spur and a calcific insertional tendoaculus, probably indicative of a Haglund's deformity. ESR was normal, CRP again was normal, and RE factor was within its normal limits. This needs to be done because we need to rule out a spondyloarthropathy, which is the reason for heel and tendoculus pain. Before we venture into evaluating this patient, we need to understand the differential diagnosis of heel pain. Plantar fasciitis, tendoculus pain, or a pre-existing spondyloarthropathy, which could be the reason for a chronic heel pain. What value does an ultrasound examination bring for evaluation of plantar fasciopathy? The plantar fascia thickness can be measured at its calcaneal insertion. You could see small little tears or sometimes a fibroma. You could see there is a calcaneal spur which can be visualized by moving the probe medial to lateral. Sometimes a retrocalcaneal bursitis and an Achilles tendinopathy which can also be visualized by uh, high resolution ultrasonography. Generally, it is a little bit difficult to examine the plantar fascia by ultrasonography because of a thick sole which will prevent from ultrasound waves being transmitted through. You could see there is a calcaneum here and this is the plantar fascia. This is the contour of the plantar fascia. You could see some pathological changes, some tears within the substance of the fascia. Generally, you could always see some inflammatory changes within the fascia. Sometimes an enhanced color Doppler, so always use a color Doppler to see if there are any new angiogenesis, which is suggestive of an acute inflammation. So these are the chronic inflammatory changes you need to see before you do any intervention. Sometimes if you are a little lucky enough, a little bit tilt of the probe can visualize the entire plantar fascia, attachment to the calcaneum, a little pathological changes in the form of micro, micro tears and there is a perifacial fluid collection which is indicative of an acute inflammation. Always never forget to examine the tendo Achilles in its long axis as well as the short axis. Here this is the long axis examination of the tendo Achilles. There is a calcaneum with the patient prone. This is calcaneum. This is the long axis of the Achilles tendon, which is a little uh, tendinopathic. You could see a bit of calcification within the substance of the tendon, both on the long and short axis. And there is inflammation just below the tendo Achilles, which is retrocalcaneal bursitis, very minimal retrocalcaneal bursitis, which I'm not planning to intervene at this moment. To summarize, these are the pathologies we need to look for. A plantar fasciopathy, a spur, sometimes a tear or a fibroma, an Achilles tendinopathy, a retrocalcaneal bursitis, and a Haglund deformity. There is no better position than the prone position 
to examine as well as intervene for a plantophagia injection. Try to keep the patient with the foot hanging down. Patient is in prone position. The feet is hanging down. Examine the long axis of the fascia as well as the short axis. The short axis examination may not be that useful to look at the pathologies, but it is very useful for an intervention. The long axis examination of the tender Achilles up and down with a little bit dorsiflexion and plantar flexion movement of the foot will give you better imaging as well as information about the tender Achilles. You could see the short axis of the tendon, which is always good to see for injection of retrocalcaneal bursitis. So what are the interventional options? Steroids, which is most commonly performed, a PRP injection into the plantar fascia, sometimes very rarely, dextrose is also used as an intervention. Prior to any intervention on the plantar fascia, particularly a painful PRP injection, always try to use posterior tibial nerve block with the patient's supine so that you don't have any pain during or after the procedure, which is most important for a PRP injection. It's always good prior to a PRP injection or a steroid injection, try to fix your targets. These are the tears which I'm going to address with a PRP injection. Prior to the intervention, we prepared around 3 to 4 ml of PRP from 35 ml of whole blood and inject into the plantar fascia substance wherever we could see that inflammation and tears. The PRP is injected intrafacially as well as perifacially. The post procedure advice is of utmost importance because it is going to be a nagging problem at least for five to seven days. A patient is advised absolute rest with a lot of ice pack at the injection site, even though it is a little bit controversial. Use tablet tramadol 50 milligrams twice or thrice a day even sometimes and review the patient after five days. Generally, a little bit of redness and swelling at the site of injection is expected. The important clinical pearls while doing the scanning as well as injection. Use a lot of gel and gain to get optimal visualization of the plantar fascia without much of anisotropy. Never ever combine a PRP and a steroid because the PRP is not going to work if you are going to use an anti-inflammatory, particularly in the form of steroids or even a post-procedure NSAIDs. Discussing the outcome of this particular patient, there was 100% pain relief four weeks after two sessions of PRP injection. Steroids was always a viable option, but this patient was planned for a PRP injection, particularly because of the pathologies, there were a lot of micro tears within the substance. So we plan for a PRP injection. Thank you.